because I wasn't sure how I was going to hold the flashlight, turn the pages, and read at the same time, and be able to stand. But I'm glad that we got that matter resolved. Thank you. Thank you, Missouri Power and Lights. <laughs> It's good to see our brethren here from Hutchinson, from Enid, Locust Grove, and Woodward, and Wichita, and of course, Butler. Did I miss anybody? Got everybody. Okay. Um, can I ask a question? Um, how many preachers do we have in the house? Would you stand, please? Bill, you go ahead and stay seated, please. But all the preachers in the house, would you stand? Everybody, retired preachers, preachers have been trained, everybody. Okay, John, where, there you go, okay. All right, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine preachers in the house. How many Bible teachers do we have in the house? Male and female, would you stand? Bible teachers, male and female. We've got a lot. I hope you folks are taking it in. Thank you. Be seated. These are the ones, the preachers and the Bible teachers, male and female, who teach this generation and the next generation. And I'm hoping that you young people are going to follow suit because we old guys, I can now say that, we old guys, uh, I'll be 83 next month, and, um, <laughs> you know, we feel like it's time to almost pass it on to the next generation. And, um, you know, we really look for potential, and we have some good potential in this audience, some fine young people. Some of you graduated. Oh, I want to extend congratulations to you. Yes, Taylor, stand up. Uh, Shaley. Where's Kaylee? Kaylee? Is, Ma is Michaela here? Michaela? Is she here? Michaela? She graduated also, didn't she? Okay, these are high school graduates. Congratulations to you. Now, be seated. What we're hoping you t will do, uh, especially as you graduate, whether you go to college or to mother school or whatever line of service you decide to pursue, that you remember that you are servants of God, even as these men and women stood, these teachers and these preachers stood, we expect you to be the next generation to pick up the baton and teach Bible. Hello? Is this thing on? Okay. I want to thank you for welcoming us. Uh, we had a good trip. We had some, some difficulty getting here, but we, we are glad... <laughs> that we are here. Thank you for the assignments. I appreciated the message this morning, and Chris did a fine job despite the adversity of no lights. He knew his message. He knew his message. Brethren, I would like for you, if you would please, take your Bibles and turn to two locations. Turn to Acts 23 and verse 1, and also, if you would, turn to Acts 24 and verse 16. I want you to look at 23 one first, Acts 23, 1. Now it says, as Paul beheld their assembly, he said, Men, my brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God up unto this day. Now he's standing before Ananias, the high priest. And in the next line, Ananias gave authority and said, Smack him. And he smote him, one of his guards smote him in the face, simply for telling the truth. Paul was persecuted. But he still maintained a good conscience. Acts 24 and 16. Acts 24 and 16. Just a little bit of a story here. And that is that after this occurred in Acts 23, 1, they sent him to the governor, Felix. And he is able now to make a defense before Felix, the governor. And if you look in verse 16, actually verse 15, it says, And I have the same hope in God, 
which they themselves hold, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And then in verse 16, Paul says, For this reason I labor to strive. I always labor to strive. I labor to have always a clear conscience before God and before men. Now, I want to ask you, have you ever examined this passage of Scripture before and understood the context that Paul was a Pharisee who had been zealous against the churches of Christ in early times, sought and placed many men and women in jails. Lives were taken. He headed the persecution in Acts chapter 8, and Stephen was stoned. You know about that, don't you? Oh, thank you, son. I have a bottle of water, but every little bit helps. Oh, this is good. Mm. Thank you. Now, we understand that Paul is, is um, on trial for the faith. Paul, in his own defense before Felix and before others, speaks with confidence because his conscience is clear. He spoke truth about the promises that God made to Israel through the long-awaited hope of Israel, namely, that Christ Jesus would come. All of Old Testament history is about someone is coming. In the garden, you understood, in Genesis 3.15, God says there was someone coming. And then as you go through the books coming after that, it specifies that somebody is coming. Moses heard him say, in Deuteronomy 18, he was going to raise a prophet like unto himself. And in fact, this prophet was Jesus. Acts chapter 2 tells us that. Now, one of the things I want you to see is not just the story here, but understand Paul was able to stand before a group of people who were persecuting him, and his conscience was clear. Paul understood he had done nothing as far as God was concerned. And in fact, he elevated the cause of Christ. Now, let's talk about conscience. We know the pleasure of being at ease in our own souls. No barriers between us or God or between us and our neighbors. We know what it's like to have a good conscience. However, we also understand that there are soul disruptors. Things that come in, things that creep in. Attitudes, actions, words. And it changes the picture. And the inner soul struggles. And we don't always have the good conscience. That's what this message is about today. The good conscience. And I would ask you, as a Christian, you may do great things. You may be known to have a great name. But on the inside, are you able to walk hand in hand with yourself? Amos 3.3 3 says, how can two walk together lest they be agreed, right? Now, it's difficult for men, friends, to walk together because sometimes they have disagreements. And I will say to you, whenever you have a disagreement with someone, if you can, as much as it depends on you, be at what? With who? All men. Take it upon yourself to be at peace with all men. Now, it's hard for two people to walk together. But have you ever had a situation where you were having this talk with yourself and you're having this argument back and forth and it doesn't appear that anybody's winning and there's a struggle inside? It's the conscience. Maybe it was something that you said. Maybe it was something that you did. Maybe you endorsed something that you should not have endorsed. Maybe you were hanging out where you shouldn't have been hanging out. But the result is you feel unclean. You feel like you and God cannot communicate because there's a barrier between the two of you. It might be your attitude toward a brother. Hello? Sometimes it happens. I've had to work on that. Anybody else ever have to work on that? Sometimes it may be difficulties between you and your spouse. Now I have to tell you, my wife is a perfect wife, and one of the things that makes her perfect is that she has a perfect husband. <laughs> we very rarely differ, and if we do, she doesn't say anything. She just picks up a frying pan and... <laughs> yeah. 
Now, you understand that sometimes there are conflicts between people. But I want to ask you, would you like to have a right conscience? There are some things that you can do to have a right conscience. Now, I have secured permission to administer something to you that may be of benefit. Now, I worked in law enforcement for close to 20 years, and I have seen uh, the use of polygraph. Anyone here ever gone through a polygraph where they tie you up? Actually, they just hook you up, and they ask you questions to, to establish a baseline, like your first and last name. They'll ask you, do you live in Missouri or do you live in Texas? And they want to know how you respond to truthful questions. Then the grilling begins. Well, I would like to help you. I would like to assist you and myself in maintaining a good conscience. But it requires that we undergo this spiritual polygraph. Now, I have some training, but I am not the one who can validate the answers. I have called in an expert, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will listen to the questions that I will ask you, the up-close and personal questions. And if you answer them correctly, he will validate you. But if you lie to yourself, kick against the truth, he will also hopefully convict you of the need to make change. Hence, you're on your way for a better conscience. I've had to do this with myself. Sometimes I've had a three-way conversation, me, myself, and the Lord. And he speaks to both of us. The side that wants to say yes and the side that says no. God speaks to both of us. Tonight, or today, he's going to speak to us. Now, in order for me to do this, I have to secure your full cooperation. I have to ask the questions up close and personal questions. I need you to raise your right hand. Do you promise to answer truthfully to all questions? Now, we should not have to take an oath. Especially as we stand before God. I remember in the scriptures where there was a husband and wife who lied to the Holy Spirit and God struck them dead. I hope that you will be truthful because I cannot account for the consequences. <laughs> I ask these questions, these up close personal questions, because the soul that you save may be your own. Now, I'm going to just ask the first question here, and I want you to think about it. This may seem like a very simple question, but it's a baseline question. You know, when I ask these questions, these are good for measuring the health of your good conscience. Here's the first question. Have you obeyed the gospel? Now, that's a question I can ask in a room full of Christians, and everybody would say yes. But I don't know that everybody in this room has obeyed the gospel. And so I will ask this. According to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6, it says that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the scriptures indicate that we're to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He died for you, shedding his blood, washing away your sins and mine. John 3, 16. Somebody could quote it, but I have it here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever, whoever, believes in him, should have what? Not perish, but have what? Everlasting life, okay? Romans 10, 9 says, If thou wilt, or thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So, besides belief, also confessing Christ. This is necessary as we continue to make sure that you have obeyed the plan of salvation. Acts 2.38, Peter was speaking on the day of Pentecost, and uh, he was preaching to them, and they were very convicted. And it says that they asked, Brethren, what shall we do? And he said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So now my question is, have you obeyed the gospel? Now I don't know, there could be someone in this room who has not obeyed the gospel. And so I want to encourage you to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. But if everyone in this room has already obeyed the gospel, then we've asked the first question and you have passed the test. 
I want to go a little bit deeper into something, though, that needs to be brought out. Many times when you talk to people concerning baptism, they want to talk in terms of, of baptism as a work, baptism is not something prescribed, grace is what saves us, and I want you to see something that needs to be taught. In 1 Peter 3 and 20, it says, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. And then 1 Peter 3.21 says, A like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience to God. Now, I want to show you, and I almost wish I had a chart or a blackboard, but this is okay. Um, I want you to look at comparison Old Testament with New Testament. Remember that Peter is comparing Noah's salvation with our own. I want you to catch this. Remember that Noah was saved by grace. Genesis 6, 8. It says that Noah found mercy in the eyes of the Lord. And then Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith he built an ark. And then 1 Peter 3.20, we just read that they were saved by water. It wasn't the ark that saved them. It was the water that took them from the old world into the new world. You get that, right? Okay, and then it says we, too, are saved by grace. Ephesians 2.5 uh, says that we are saved by grace. And Ephesians 2.8 says we are saved by grace through faith. And then 1 Peter 3.21 says that baptism now saves us. So I want you to see that we're saved by grace, we're saved by faith, and we're saved by water, even as Noah was. Now why am I bringing this up? I mean, everybody knows this, right? Well, I want you to look at this passage again, where it says here, and I'm going to read that. Let me read this. 1 Peter 3. Let's turn over there. Why am I bringing things up that everybody basically knows? 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, 21. It says, You are saved in the very same manner by baptism, not merely of washing the filth from the, uh, from the body, but by confessing Christ with a clean conscience, and it's by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you are baptized, what happens to the conscience? That's right, because here are some other phrases. And these, this is a difficult passage, but I want to read some other translations. Okay, it says, The answer of a good conscience, New King James, and this is supported by the following translations. Goodspeed says, the craving for a conscience right with God. Moffat says, the prayer for a clean conscience before God. Rotherham says, the request unto God for a good conscience. Revised Standard Version, which Ken Strieber used to use, says an appeal to God for a clear conscience. What we're saying, people, is that when we're baptized, our sins are washed away and it results in a clear conscience. Not often do I hear that made reference to. For some reason, we don't talk in terms of the conscience being clear, being clean, being a good conscience as a result of baptism. But there it is. Now that you are saved and your conscience is clear, again, we have to be concerned about things that might come and stand in the way. Thus, one is baptized because they also desire a clear conscience. A clear conscience. All right, so everybody's on the same page, right? So now let me begin the serious grilling. Here's the next question. Are you living in conformity with the Son of God? Are you living according to the standard of the Son of God? Now you might say, well, Scotty, why do we point to Jesus Christ as the standard by which we live? It's because our Lord was perfect in word and in deed. And Jesus often spoke of pleasing his Father, and as much as possible, 
if we can imitate the Son, we too can be pleasing to the Father. Our objective is to be a son like the Son. To be a child of God. To act as a child of God should act. Paul, the apostle, imitated Jesus and he even encouraged us to do the same. Didn't he write, be ye followers of me even as I am of Christ Jesus? Certainly, certainly. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, and let's get serious. How do you know if and when you are conforming to the image of Jesus Christ? That sometimes puzzles us. Am I living according to God's standards? Am I living like the Son of God would have me to live? Well, how do you measure that? Well, a spiritual polygraph has in it this particular measure, and it's found in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9. I have to thank Ken Strever for that. He introduced me to that passage with emphasis some time ago. And I like going to it because it reminds me of the standard that Christ held and he expects us to follow. Hebrews, the very first chapter, and if you haven't studied Hebrews for a while, I would bid you to study that very first chapter, a lot of preaching that, especially concerning the deity of Christ. I think the older I get, the worse my, my hands are for turning pages. Ah, I'll find it. There I am. Okay, turn to Hebrews chapter 1, and notice in verse 8, it says, But of the Son, he says, that's God says, of the Son, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a righteous scepter. Now, God is speaking concerning Christ. And here is a passage that tells us that Christ is deity. Now, look at the next one. Christ gives, excuse me, God gives us a description concerning why he is pleased with Christ. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated what? Hello? Hated sin, iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness more than thy fellows. So one thing we could ask as far as how we know if we're conforming to the image of Christ. Ask this question. Do you love righteousness and do you hate evil? There was a man in the Old Testament, Job. And in the very first chapter, in the very first verse, God gives us a biographical description of of this holy man and he gives his approval on him and he says that Job was a man who was perfect and upright he feared God that means he held him in high esteem and then it says he avoided or he eschewed King James he avoided evil so let me ask you are you a person that one could be considered upright perfect and when I say perfect not perfect in the sense of of making a cake and that's perfect, of taking a picture, perfect picture. I'm talking in terms of mature. Are you mature in Christ? Do you still have the same old hang-ups, same old problems you had 20 years ago? You know, the scripture speaks concerning sins that easily beset us. I know what some of mine are. Do you know what some of yours are? Hmm? Yes? Sometimes... Things that we struggled with 10 years ago come back. I still have to struggle with this temper. Okay, and if I, if I keep it in check, my wife doesn't have to pick up the frying pan as much. But let me say this to you. Whatever sin that you have that so easily besets you, that causes you to struggle, you need to examine that, that dominating life sin, and make changes. And there's one solution. May I bring out the medicine, and it's a, sometimes a tough medicine to take, and um, I have a spoon, and it's called, as I dose it out here, repentance. You see, we live in a time where people are just living freely, and very few people are taking their spirituality seriously. And this whole matter of repentance is something of bygone days. People don't go forward anymore. People don't confess their sin. People don't ask people to pray for them. 
People don't seek the counsel of spiritual people because they have a sin that they're struggling with, because they want to be alone. They don't want people to know about the sin. Maybe it's a sin that they love that they don't want to disclose. Brethren, let me tell you something. Right now, the church is moving at a snail pace. We are just not doing as well as we could be doing. People are not as spiritually minded. Why? I believe that people are not willing to make changes. Not willing to repent. You know, that's something that we need to do daily. How many of you, well, I'm going to ask you how many of you take a bath daily, shower. <laughs> but you understand when you're working outside in the field, maybe you're cutting grass, uh, Brother Dowdy, and you come and you get that yucky feeling. When you wash, you feel much better. You feel much better. And it's the same thing concerning the conscience. If there is something there that indicates to you that you are loving iniquity and hating righteousness, you need to make some changes. I would need to make some changes. Do you hear me? Does it make sense? You see, you have a house, and you look at it and you say, oh, I need to chip this off, I need to put this primer on, and I need to paint over it. Maybe you go in and you take the windows out and you put new windows. And pretty soon you're going inside and you're putting new carpet, new cabinets. You're remodeling the house. We know what that's like. We know what that's like. It's never ending. But you know that this house, this house which houses the eternal, needs to also make changes. I know that you're beautiful. I know that you're gorgeous. But you still need to make changes on the inside. Does that make sense? And that requires that we look at ourselves as God sees us. As God sees us. How are we doing on the spiritual polygraph so far? Are you with me? Let me ask you, do the folks around you know that you love righteousness and hate evil? Um, it has, is it because uh, they know you by name and reputation? Do they see you a good example? Or if your name comes up, are eyebrows raised? Oh, yeah, I can tell you about him. Yeah. <laughs> Girls, boys, I have a message for you. You keep yourself chaste and pure. What? Keep yourself chaste and pure. I have known many young men, women, who have gone down the track have left righteousness, even good home value training, have left it to delve into the world. And you know, they just love that bling. They just love that bling. And it's easy for people to get attached to it. And then for it to attach itself to you. Be careful of delving into the world. You don't know what you're getting yourself into. We need to keep a clear conscience before God, 1 Peter 3, 16, so that when people throw mud at us, the mud will not stick. They'll end up realizing that they're the ones who need a bath. <laughs> Actually, 1 Peter 3, 16 says this, New American Standard, to keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which they slander you, or the thing in which you were slandered, those who revile you, good behavior in Christ, may be put to shame. Are you doing good to the folks around you is another question I would ask. Are you doing good to the folks around you? Concerning Christ Jesus, you know the passage in Acts 10 and verse 38. It says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth. This is Peter preaching to the household of Cornelius. He says, how God anointed Christ, how he anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. Well, Galatians 6.10 says, Do good to all men, especially the household of the faithful. So let me ask you, do you do good works? Do people know you by your good works? 
We have nurses here. We have volunteers here. We have teachers here. People know you in the community. The work of mercy, which is talked about in Romans 12, be it medical, teaching, feeding, volunteering as a helper, these things are always appreciated, and they're seen by the people in the community, and they understand this is real Christianity. Holiness by itself is not enough. Your works must demonstrate your faith. I say your works must demonstrate your faith. Jesus said in John 4, 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. i, I got to ask you this question. How many of you have talents with wood? How many of you have talents with wood? I mean, you can rebuild things, fix things. Raise your hand. How many of you uh, are mechanically skilled? With, to with, you know, with cars, and Chris has raised his hand twice, okay? Um, let me ask you, how many ladies can cook? I know the church in Butler better raise their hand, because I know those <laughs> folks can cook. Yes. And everybody in Enid, too. Oh, yeah. And Locust Grove, and everybody. Um, so, I'm going to ask you this question. You do these things for yourself, maybe for some of your brethren in the church. But do you do some of these things for people in the community? In the community. Do you do these things for them? Do they know that you're a person who gives yourself to help other people? Well, it's time for the church to move outside the four walls. You know, Ken Strever, he, uh, every day he gets up, Monday through Friday, he takes meals to people who cannot get out to eat. Now, Narita was a nurse, but I've known her to also do things with other people on her own time to help. You have teachers here who teach other people concerning truth. We all have talents. We all have talents. And I challenge you to use those talents. Jesus said, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. John 6, 38. I think the will of the people is that maybe we buy a nice three-bedroom home, and we move into it, and we kick back. Oh, we'll be there Sunday morning and Sunday night. We'll be there Wednesday night. But are you of service to people around you, and are your good works known? Because if they see your good works, they will glorify God. And you know what? To give is more blessed to give than to what? To receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So when you do that, how is your conscience? It feels good. It feels good because you know that you're one with yourself and with God because you did something right for somebody else. Now I know some of you are doing this. I just encourage you to keep doing it, and some of you who are not doing as much, pick up and get going, please. The people in the community need you. To have and to hold the heart of Christ means to submit to God in love and obedience and caring for other people. Jesus taught, we should teach. Jesus fed the hungry, we should feed the hungry. There are people in this congregation that may need meals taken to them, possible. Do you minister to the needs of the senior Christians, the older Christians? I see you have several older ones here. They are deserving of respect, but also they need ministry. And I would encourage you, wherever you are, do as much as you can for the older people. Let me move on. We're talking in terms of a spiritual polygraph. Here's another question. How well are you handling the difficult moments in your life? How often do you handle the difficult moments in your life? I'm asking the same question to myself. When you have illness, when you have financial struggle, you know when you have more month at the end of the money? You been there? Been there? Last name used to be Rockefeller. Now it's mud. <laughs> you go to the bank, hey, how you doing? The banker closes his blinds. Well, we understand that. You know, the scripture... The scripture tells us that we are to govern our lives by the book. Govern our lives by the leading of the, of the scriptures. 
Scripture helps to guide, balance, and fix our lives during tough times. And Paul reminds us to be at peace with all men, and it's devilish not to attempt to be at peace with all men. But when you have difficult times, do you take the initiative to solve the problem? You know, you can go over here and say, well, you know, this is what happened. And you can be the other one who can say, well, yeah, this is what happened. But what needs to happen is the two need to come together. And where there is a need for repentance, it needs to take place. It is a shame when people cannot resolve their difficulties, and yet they call themselves Christians. Hello? There are people in this audience then who need to come together and resolve. You know that, I know that, they know that. We all know that. We love you. We want the body of Christ to grow and continue, don't we? We don't want people separated. We want God's people to come together. Love is there. God loved us. You know, I was thinking about Tower of Babel. They were trying to reach heaven by building toward heaven. But God saw that it was futile, and what he did was he brought a staircase down from heaven to earth. And he did that to bridge between men and women. He did it to bridge the gap between men and women. But when Christ Jesus died on the cross, according to Ephesians 2, he brought Jew and Gentile together. Brought man and God and Jew and Gentile. That's what the symbol of the cross is. There should never be any disunity. Never. Hmm. Galatians 5.16 says, This is what I have to say. Let your steps be guided by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the cravings of the flesh. You know, being angry with other people is a gratification of the flesh. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about? Get mad at your husband. Husbands, you know how it is when you get mad at your boss. <laughs> Live by the Spirit. That's what we need to do. We need to live what we know. You know what to do. You need to live by what you know. Here's the next question. And it's the last question I'm going to ask. How are we doing on this polygraph? This message is not meant to soothe. It's meant to challenge. It's not meant to soothe. It's meant to challenge. Do you spend time in self-examination? Do you see some things there that you don't like, and do you request prayer? Why do I say that? Turn, if you would, please. Take your Bibles. Turn over to 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5. Thirteen and verse 5. I'm going to turn right now. In fact, um, Chris made re reference to this this morning. We're winding down now. 2 Corinthians um, 13 and verse 5. I want to get some other translations. I have the Aramaic translation. and I'm, I'm curious to see what you have. I have 2 Corinthians 13 in Aramaic, and it says, Examine yourselves whether you are in the same faith. Heal your souls. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? If this is not so, then you are rejected. Now, I'm not totally sure he's got everything here right. So let me hear what you have to say. What does your scripture say? Joe, you got one in front of you? 2 Corinthians 13:5. Read it real loud. Stand up and read it real loud. Can you catch that on mic? Jason, where are you? Examine yourself, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own self. Know you not your own self. Because Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobate. Now, I was looking at that word prove. And it is a word that's used to assay metal. When it says prove, you subject the metal to fire and heat to test its strength and its purity. He is saying to you, 
in the terms of a miner, okay, a gold miner or an ore miner, to take your faith and subject it to fire. Examine it closely for its strength and its purity to see if you're in the faith or you may in fact fail the test. It's a test. Well, it says that you are to examine yourself, but also do you request prayer? I'm going to put these together here because I want you to see something. Hebrews 13, 18 says, Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Put that together. He says, examine yourself. If you find something lacking, will you ask others for prayer? He said, pray for us that we might have a clear conscience. So here are the questions at the end. You have to tell yourself how you did. Have you obeyed the gospel? Are we living in conformity, excuse me, are we living in conformity with the Son of God? And how well are we handling the difficult moments of our lives? Do you spend time in self-examination and do you request prayer? Those are questions that are up close and personal. What will you do? What will you do? Today is a day for decision making. It's a day when changes need to occur in the churches of Christ. But changes begin with us individually, with me, with you, there in the pew, as you go back to wherever your congregation might be. What decisions do you need to make? What decisions do you need to make? Our song is number 212. 212, in faith and praise. I heard this earlier today. And I like this song. And thank you. I had not arranged it ahead of time. But thank you, Courtney. When I look into your holiness, when I gaze into your loveliness, when all things that surround become shadows in the light of you, I worship you. It's time to leave those idols. It's time to separate yourself from those things which block clear conscience what do you need to do do you need to come forward and say something do you need to make changes we're here to help but I'll tell you this the church of Christ as we are now there's things we need to do we need to get busy souls are languishing while we are not as progressive as we ought to be I want to have a stand as we turn to 212 we're going to sing the whole song when I 